Hello everyone and welcome to today's live stream IMRES TV webinar on the IBAT, which is the Integrated Biodiversity Assessment Tool. Throughout the course of the webinar, please use the discussion area to post any questions you would like to ask the speaker. Please feel free to ask questions throughout and these will be answered at various points throughout the webinar. Today we are joined by Eugenie, a skilled scientist who over the past 15 years has developed wide expertise in biodiversity conservation with a particular focus on monitoring, indicators and accounting and the application of science to policy and decision making. Eugenie is the IBAT manager and has been in that role since January. She works across the four IBAT Alliance organisations. They are the UN Environment World Conservation Monitoring Centre, IUCN, Conservation International and BirdLife International. Eugenie, thank you for joining us today. Please feel free to go ahead. Thanks Anastasia and thank you very much for having me. So welcome everyone to the webinar on accessing and interpreting biodiversity information for high level biodiversity screening. As Anastasia said, I'm the IBAT manager, which is the integrated biodiversity assessment tool run across our four organisations. So this, I'm just push, pushing through the slides now. So firstly, so that's it, just thanks to say, to say thanks for the people who filled in the survey at the beginning. And it's great to see your backgrounds and to see that lots of you are not familiar with IBAT um, before this webinar. So it's good to know where we're starting and great to see the kind of things you'd like to see in terms of improvements in biodiversity data dissemination. So I'll, I'll jump straight in. This is the outline for the webinar today, and I'm going to talk about why biodiversity is important to consider, how to consider biodiversity in development projects, then I'll talk about the new IBAT portal and then move on to questions and answers. But please feel free to ask questions or post questions online um, while we're going through, and I'm happy to answer questions while we're going through the, the webinar. So why is biodiversity important to consider in development projects? I'm just putting up a, um, a summary of a paper that was published a while ago and it looked at the key um, reasons for delays to oil and gas projects. And interestingly, over half of delays were attributed to non-technical issues. And social conflict over environmental resources was the single biggest factor. So biodiversity can have a real impact on projects, no matter what type of project they are. Here's another example of a mine in Costa Rica. There was a series of delays and closures over 20 years. Um, at the bottom you can see that the company lost over 94 million US dollars because of this. And the main reason was around uh, um, protesters and locals being angry about impacts to biodiversity. And I've put up this uh, macaw as a picture and this is specifically um, a bird that was involved in this um, at the, the core of this issue. On the positive side, sustainable companies outcompete their competitors, and the Dow Jones Sustainability Index comprises looks at global sustainability leader, leaders. And interestingly, those companies with strong sustainability scores outperform other companies listed on the index. And protection of biodiversity is one of the DJSI criteria. So again, not just is there um, a risk can cause project delays, etc., but actually taking biodiversity into account, taking environment into account can have positive impacts on a company. This is a graph that I've adapted from the International Finance Corporation. They listed biodiversity business risks and opportunities. And here I've summarized the opportunities from that. So A, by having good biodiversity management, you can help secure a license to operate. You can help maintain access to capital. So lots of financial institutions, international financial institutions now have environmental performance standards, which include biodiversity. So you need to adhere to those performance standards in order to get financing. It can help reduce operating costs. As I mentioned, delays in those projects showing that operating costs were increased when biodiversity wasn't properly taken into account. can also enhance uh, reputation and brand for a company. And a lot of companies now find that the general public are looking for this and actually investors as well. And you know, a company putting itself at the forefront or leading in a sector, they're often expected to have good environmental standards as well. A project I worked on in um, a couple of years ago 
um, when we did this, uh, lots of changed all their biodiversity management practices and improved them greatly, we were surprised to see the improvement in staff productivity and morale around this. And a lot of people think this is quite a wishy-washy one, but it was a very real impact um, that I think is a really interesting, say, you know, um, effect of, of good biodiversity management practice, because biodiversity has a lot of emotion around it as well. And then finally, increasing market access. So um, I have seen the situation where companies going into a country and wanting to um, bid for a development project, and the country has chosen that company with a good environmental performance um, re and reputation. So that's around the why. I'm going to jump into then how to specifically consider biodiversity in development projects. And please do uh, put in any questions that you have um, and send them to Alex's monitoring questions on the, the line here. I wanted to tell a, a personal story of a project I was involved with. Our client came to us after they had spent over 1 million US dollars on their environmental impact assessment. They wanted to align with the International Finance Corporation Performance Standard 6, which is, which is a standard around biodiversity and ecosystem services. Um, and it was after the fact that they wanted to do this. When we had a look at the ESHA, they had missed priority biodiversity because they hadn't undertaken this early high level risk screening at the beginning of the project. The screening would have identified critical habitat qualifying species and habitats in the region. So critical habitat is specifically what the IOC performance standard 6 is looking for. And if they'd just done a high level biodiversity risk screening and be able to prioritise against those performance standards, they would have been able to focus the scope of their environmental impact assessment much better and would have saved a lot of time and money. And in fact, you know, it was a number of years added on to the time frame of the project because we had to do on the ground surveys after the fact. So it had a real, you know, that's my personal story, just showing that there was a real impact of not doing you know, a quick desktop survey um, of biodiversity. And this is a paper that I published in 2017 and we had a look at the value of the IUCN Red List, so that's the International Union for Conservation of Nature and the Red List is a global assessment of how under threat species are at, uh, for, the, at the risk, for the risk of extinction. And we broke down, okay, so if you are working on a project and this is specifically how do you take biodiversity into account and what biodiversity information do you take into account? So along the top, we've put the project timeline. So starting at exploration and assessment, initial project design, final project design, execution, construction, commissioning, operation, and then say this is maybe you know a mining or oil and gas project, reclamation, closure and decommissioning. And so along the next level, we've got biodiversity management, which goes from early biodiversity risk screening, which is what I'm specifically talking about today. But you can see that biodiversity is taken into account right throughout the project timeline. And then here is where the use of the red list comes in. And the red list is one of the three data sets that we have on the on IBAT, the Integrated Biodiversity Assessment Tool. So the use of the red list in exploration and assessment stage would be around screening sites for the potential presence of significant species. So for example, ones that would trigger IFC performance standard six, such as critically endangered or endangered species. So there are, those are species on the brink of extinction. You can also help it to inform high level design of a project, to focus baseline surveys, tailor appropriate mitigation, focusing monitoring, etc. And then this is the type of data that is within the red list. So within IBAT, you can access the assessment information you can access a geographic range and range map and more and more I want to add in more of the depth of information that we have so add in information like well is the population increasing or decreasing so it's critically endangered um, but is it an increasing population so is it doing quite well or is it still decreasing habitat and ecology well which habitat um, is it associated with what kind of ecology does it have is it does it have a use or trade and what are the key threats to it so all of that information is available within the red list and that information is really really useful in informing your um, biodiversity management so that's around the how i don't know if there's any questions come through from anyone at the moment uh, no there's no live uh, questions come through so far so okay. uh okay. i'll let you know if there's any come through but questions Great. In the next section i will dive into IBAT and um, 
what it is and why I'm sitting here today specifically. So as Anastasia said, I took over as the management of IBAT, the manager of IBAT in January. And it's a really exciting time to have got involved in IBAT because we have been completely developing, redeveloping our online portal from the bottom up. It's been going for over 10 years now and built on older technology. And so last year there was a big review sitting down, okay, is IBAT still useful for people? Are uh, users using it? Is it having the impact that our conservation organisations originally wanted when we set up the tool? And in fact, when we worked with sat down with each other, but also with our users and consulted them, the um, result was that IBAT actually had a huge application that was underutilised, that they wanted to see it completely revamped and that it had huge potential. So in 2018, we've been redeveloping the portal and that's why it was a great opportunity to come and talk to Amiris members about the new IBAT portal and what you can do with it and also some new functionalities that will come on board in the future. What is it? It is a web-based map and reporting tool, provides fast, easy, integrated access to critical biodiversity information, for example, priority species like in the IUCN Red List, legally protected areas and internationally recognised biodiversity areas. It was initially co-developed with the World Bank Group, which was interesting for me coming on board in January to understand where it came from. And the World Bank Group wanted to have much better implementation of their performance standards and this extends beyond IFC performance standard, but also World Bank have got their environmental and social performance standards now as well. The focus was on critical habitat screening, but specifically around making our data available so that people could screen for biodiversity in a much more efficient way. We draw from core data sets managed and compiled by the IBAT Alliance partners, and as we mentioned there, IUCN, UN Environment World Conservation Monitoring Centre, BirdLife International and Conservation International. I invite you, I can see that some people have already signed up to the portal, but I invite you as well to, while you're on the webinar or on the recording afterwards, to have a look at the website and to sign in and create a free account and have a play around with it. And if you have any questions from playing around with it now, I'd be really happy to answer them. But yeah, this is this is our new portal that we've only launched in the last couple of weeks. And actually we've done, I was saying it to Anastasia and Alex, we've done a slow, soft launch um, because there's always things that go wrong when you launch online portals. And we're still developing some of the functionality um, within this um, redevelopment period. And then also we're getting, we're hiring a full-time web developer in 2019 so we can continue with this redevelopment so that we're not just doing a complete redevelopment, this is just, just a once-off. We now see this as a beta version that we're going to keep improving the functionality all the time. This was um, a survey I'd put out before around key improvements in general that people would like to see in biodiversity data dis dissemination. And this was a similar question that you got when you logged in for this event as well. And you've mentioned you'd like more baseline data gathering, um, more effort to keep everybody informed, um, help organisations involved with biodiversity and also more through email. And then other people, this is from the International Association for Impact Assessors, said that they would like to see biodiversity data regularly updated, like to see an explicit link with environmental and social safeguards, uh, like to see the data available for consultancy work, for it to be consistent and transparent, to increase the number of data sets available in one tool, minimise misinterpretation of data and make it more affordable and easily available for commercial users. So we've really taken this into account. The key focus for us is making sure that people can get what they need rather than us pushing what we think people need. Key features of IBAT is that it's a one-stop shop for protected areas, key biodiversity areas and red list of species data. It's the only place to access this data for commercial use. We are specifically focused on generating things like IFC PS6, uh, GRI and custom reports. You can create portfolios of sites and you can download data direct from source. And one of the key um, users I suppose I've been engaging with quite a lot is consultants and how we can make it much more easily usable and um, appropriate for that set of users. 
So I, I, will, I can go on live to the portal at the end of the webinar if people are interested, but I'll just, I've got these screenshots and I'll take you through. I wonder if I, I'll take the mouse and see if I can highlight some areas. So this is the home page and it shows you here as well the last data update. So the data now, the technology we've built on pulls on web services and APIs from our data sets. And so whenever a data set is updated, IBAT is automatically updated. The IUCN Red List of Species is updated two, three times a year. And they're always, they, they reassess species to see if they're still under risk, at risk of extinction. They also are bringing in more and more species and so new assessments of new species. So the database is growing the whole time. The World Database on Protected Areas is updated on a monthly basis. The data comes in from governments. And so whenever the World Database of Protected Areas is updated, it's immediately updated on IBAT. Um, I pulled that slide off the ANC um, in April, and that was in the last data update was, was there. This is one of our, our test versions. Um, and then the World Database on Key Biodiversity Areas is, like the IUCN Red List, it is updated two to three times a year. Of course, they don't all operate, um, get updated in sync. So having the web services and APIs mean that they're immediately available on IBAT. So that's one of the, the first things I wanted to highlight. Then if you go to login, if you don't already have an account, it uh, says you there, it tells you there, and then you can go and create an account. But this is me, so this is what it looks like if you have an account. And I can log in. And the first thing that I see is a dashboard. And I can either go straight into looking at an overview of my projects and reports that I've put and saved in there, or I can go and look at the map viewer. I can go straight to data downloads or country profiles, which summarizes information at a country level. A lot of consultants will come in and they'll say, well, I just need to go in and download the data to pull into our own GIS system and add infrastructure layers, etc., onto it. Um, but there's a, you know, that's why we've got these three, I suppose, or four options for where you go in. And then lots of users like to go straight into the map and have start to play around with the maps. This quickly shows me shows the top sites that I have. I can sort by overlap with protected areas, overlap with threatened species, or overlap with key biodiversity areas. You can see I created that one on the 1st of November. And here's a, here's a bug in the system at the moment. This should say 2018, but the 18 has dropped off. That's one of the bugs that hasn't been <laughs> sorted out yet. And I created that site and I just named it Frank's Favourite Spot because I was showing it to a friend of mine called Frank. So I'll just click on the data map and this is the mapping um, side of it. So it's a, a typical mapping system. You can come down here and you can add layers on and off like satellites, etc. You can look at add all your projects onto the map. You can zoom in and out. You can apply layers and you, you can also create sites. And one of the key functionalities that we've added to the new system is that you can create a polyline. So if you have a linear um, piece of infrastructure, you can create a polygon and you can also just create a point. So before IBAC could just create points. If I show you about applying layers, you can select layers at the side here. So say I'm interested in sites of biodiversity importance. This adds on key biodiversity areas layers and you can see that you can also filter by just adding important bird and, bio bird and biodiversity areas or IBAs. AZEs, which are Alliance for Zero Extinction Sites, and then other there, non-bird and non-AZE key biodiversity areas. And this little question mark gives you a definition of what a key biodiversity area is. And so we hope to have, and we have it as much as possible, but we'll improve like question marks. So if anyone has any questions, well, what does this data mean and how do I interpret it? We've got that there. And you can see that the layers have been added on. I can add protected areas as well. Again, I can filter by a range of filters. So I can look at the IUCN management category or the governance or the designation. Here I've put um, by designation. So you can see Natura 2000 sites, say, coming up in red. You can see them up here. But if I just zoom in, so what I've done, I'll go back for a second. I've gone and I've, um, in theory before, put made that to the side and then I've been able to zoom in on the map and I've zoomed right here um, on the coast of Gabon and then clicked on a protected area and it comes up and tells me what that protected area is, the name of it. It tells me the designation, it says it's an aquatic reserve. The governance is that it's a federal or a national ministry or agency who governs the 
protected area and the IUCN management category hasn't been assigned. And if I was to click on this or click through to the Protected Planet website, which gives me much more information about that specific protected area. So that's the kind of level of um, information that you can get um, from those layers. And I can also, you can see down here, I can add various layers on and off as well. I'll go back one more time and show you down here I can then create, so I'm still interested in this area and actually I want to create a site here. So I have drawn a polygon in this area, I've clicked save and I've created a site page for myself. So a site page is automatically created and this gives me a high level summary of the overlap within 50 kilometres of red listed species. You can see here all the different threat categories. So I have an overlap in that site with 12 critically endangered species, with 26 endangered species, 66 vulnerable species, 46 near threatened, 1581 least concern and 129 that are definitely deficient. And if I click on these question marks here, it gives me the definition for each of those threat categories. Down the page, it shows me the overlap with protected areas and it shows me the overlap with key biodiversity areas. So this is the summary site level page that you get when you create a site. And if you see here, if I want to get the full list, so say the full list of species, it says create a new report to view full list. And I would click here and create a new report. And this would bring me to this page, which gives me the option of creating a proximity report, which is simply, um, I can put buffers in myself. You can see here I can select various buffers, what's within X kilometer proximity of the site I'm interested in. I can create a PS6 report, which we've now renamed to a World Bank Group Biodiversity Screening Report, because it covers both IFC PS6 and the World Bank ESS6. And so that's specifically tailored around those two um, performance standards. I can do a custom report, so save some of the settings that I'm interested in specifically. I can do a freshwater report if I'm in an area where I think I'm going to have impact on freshwater and look at the hydro basins upstream and downstream of my site. And I can also do a GRI report, and actually that functionality we're building at the moment, and that is where we can do multi multiple sites in one report. Or you could do it, say, across a whole company and get an idea of, you know, X percentage of my sites are within one kilometre, say, of protected areas or key biodiversity areas or critically endangered species. So this is the reporting functionality. And within the report, you get a PDF file. And in the PDF file, that is a high level summary of your species, so critically endangered and endangered species. You get the species names, taxonomic groups, etc. You get the key biodiversity area in its name, the protected area, and the report is summarized in a way that is according to the report type. But also with the PDF, you get uh, CSV files, and in the CSV file, you get the full um, data in there so you can sort by all sorts of things you can um, import it into whatever you want we also have maps in the folder and we've got a readme file so a report comes as a folder with a whole suite of um, files within that so that's the reports this is what the pdf in the reports looks like so on the front page you have a, a map showing where your site is you have a quick high level summary of overlap with protected areas, key biodiversity areas and IUCN red list. And this actually is just critically endangered and endangered species. And you can see here as well, this is the World Bank um, biodiversity screening report. And we've also added in critical habitat here because that's specifically um, relevant to the World Bank group. So this is what the front pages look like of those reports. If we go back to our dashboard, so out of the mapping part of it, I can also see as well back to my um, projects. I can click on here and go into projects and reports in more detail. But I'll take you to data downloads, which is one of the areas that we've developed um, specifically for consultancies. And so they want to come in and they say, right, I'm only interested in this area in Brazil, for example. So they have drawn a polygon in this area we also give the option of uploading one polygon at a time if it's in a KMZ or KMV file. 
we also give the option that people can upload a CSV file with hundreds of sites if they want to be able to put their sites quickly into IMAT. But say in this case you are a consultant or a company and you've just you've got one project and you want to do a screening with IBAT for that one project. I can either upload a polygon or I can create a polygon here. It tells me the area is 132,000 square kilometres and I can click on download the data through that. So you can just come in, um, get the data and come out of the tool again. So we've made it as quick and efficient and easy as possible um, depending on the different users. So this is really a consultant user, a GIS specialist who wants to come in, take a download of a data for a very specific area and pull it into their own GIS system. So that's the data download for a specific site. And then we also have up here uh, where you can download the full global data set. So you can download the full world database on protected areas, the full world database of key biodiversity areas, and the full IUCN red list spatial data. That comes with a health warning because it's, um, there it says over 88,000 species, but it's over 96,000 now. So it's a huge, <laughs> a huge data set. It's the largest by far of the data sets that we have. So I'll talk to you about the subscription costs for IBAD, but also to talk about first, why is there a cost for some of the IBAT services? So you can create an account for free and some of you can see that there. And you can do a lot of the turning layers on and off and creating sites within the free account. So everyone can see the data and access it no matter who you are. And that was really important for us and it's a big change. Before we had three different sites and we've brought them into one and everyone can see the same thing. And a colleague of ours, Diego Hufe Bignoli, put this paper together where he went around our organizations and you said, how much do, does it cost? How much staff do we have? How much does it cost um, to, to maintain, update the data sets, um, etc.? And he came up with this estimate of 6.5 million US dollars to 14 million US dollars per year to update and maintain our data sets. Um, I don't think anyone had really thought about it before. This doesn't include volunteers, this doesn't include government time in um, maintaining the data sets themselves and sending them to us, etc. But I suppose it does show there's a huge amount of work in the background. The Protected Areas programme is at least 10 people working specifically on the World Database of Protected Areas. So it's really interesting to say, OK, well now we have a handle on how much it costs our organisations. And IBAT is a really important mechanism for some cost recovery of that. So the, the subscriptions are starts at free if you want to go into, say, country profiles. I didn't talk about them much, actually, um, but they are a summary of a protected areas, key biodiversity areas and red list species at a country level. And it was specifically for government users, but actually a lot of our companies use it to understand the context of their projects. You can look at the visual data map, you can create and save sites. When you want to start creating reports, that's when the um, paid subscription comes in. So it's all around the added value services we're adding to our data sets. And um, the basic pro and enterprise, most of our oil and gas companies are on the enterprise. Actually, all of them are on the enterprise subscription level. Our financial institutions tend to all be on the pro levels and then say smaller companies on the basic subscription level. But also for consultancies, what we've done, because that was a key feedback, is making it affordable to be for small projects. And you only need a small area, so you don't need a full global data set or access to a full global data set. So we've also got a pay-as-you-go pricing, and that varies from uh, $750 for a single report to $5,000 US for a million square kilometres of data that you would put into a GIS system. I thought it was interesting as well for you to see who our users are. So you can see here the energy and extractive sector who are IBAT subscribers. Within the finance sector, um, and there's over 22 financial institutions now. BPI France, who are the French Export Credit Agency, have just signed up. Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank are signing up next year. Um, Inter-American Development Bank are also signing up at the moment. Consultancies, you can see a range of consultancies who access IBAT and they're all accessing it on a pay-as-you-go for their clients. And then there's a whole range of other users as well. TomTom, Tom, for example, um, have the World Database of Protected Areas in their, in their um, TomTom sat-navs. Mm -hmm. 
uh, Toyota, um, cement industry use it, Aditya Birla Group. Yeah, so a whole range of users, um, mainly energy and extractors and finance, but a whole um, growing area of other um, companies using iBet as well. So these are just the private sector users. In terms of non-commercial users, we also have A Russia Ghana, WWF, Harvard University, Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership. It's a whole range of non-commercial users. So from a perspective of an IMRS member, what can IBAT do for you? Well, it's designed for early, fast, efficient and cost-effective biodiversity risk screening. And some of our users will screen 10 to 12 projects a day using IBAT. They go in, they take five minutes quickly, overlay layers or generate a site page and go, OK, biodiversity isn't an issue for this project or it is for another. And then they can trigger the next steps in their internal risk screening process. It's extremely useful, as I mentioned, that case that I was involved in, in avoiding project delays and risks up front. So you can save a lot of money and a lot of time by quickly going in and, and using this and doing this high level screening because the data now is the most up to date data. Um, it's really useful from that point of view. Some of the other functionality I want to add in is, you know, if you did a project two years ago that and the data changed and I've had this experience where species have gone from least concerned to critically endangered, it will send you an alert to tell you, you know, because your project is still may not even be under development. And you want to know if biodiversity um, has changed in the meanwhile. So we'll be able to give you an alert. That's what I want to develop a new functionality in 2019. Accessing the most up-to-date and authoritative biodiversity data. You get an overview of sites against key biodiversity values. You can create these bespoke project reports. Companies will use these to, as an appendix, appendix to maybe their risk screening or their ESHA. Um, we're developing the functionality for GRI reports across a whole company portfolio. That functionality will come in in 2019 as well. And then the downloading data for internal GIS teams. Yeah. Yeah, so that's that's the end of, of what I've got to say. But I'd love to hear if there's any questions on the line come through yet. Uh, great. Well, thank you very much for a really useful and interesting introduction to the IBAT tool, Eugenie. Um, while we're waiting for any questions to come in um, from our online viewers at home, I'll kick off uh, with a question. How do consultants typically use the IBAT in their projects? So, good question, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is, uh, is there a range of ways? I'm thinking of the various consultancies that use it. So they normally don't have their own annual subscription. Normally what they do is they're accessing it through pay-as-you-go. They will um, either, when they're pitching for a project, tendering for a project, they will put in an IBAT pay-as-you-go payment at the beginning, or they will access it through the company's subscription. So if you're working for one of the oil and gas companies that have a subscription already, they'll go in and access it through that subscription. And normally what they'll do is they'll go in, they'll create that polygon within the area of interest. So say it's the discrete management unit, if you're doing Anisha for IFC PS6, for example, they'll put that area in via polygon and then they'll download the data from that area and pull it directly into their own GIS system and create their own maps with it, etc. Just to say as well, so it's like a cookie cutter, so that polygon will cookie, cookie cut and then deliver the information that's within that polygon. But also if you have a red listed species or a protected area or a key biodiversity area, those all of the polygons for the range of the species will be delivered in that. So if your species has a global range, you'll get the full range of that species because there's no point having just the bit that mm -hmm. overlaps with your project. You want to have a global understanding of the species range. Yeah. So that's mainly how consultants use. Excellent. Now, I know we were talking about this uh, a little bit earlier, but I wonder if you could um, sort of talk the listeners through a little bit about how you see IBAT progressing in the future, like what tools and what features you're going to be adding in the coming uh, months or coming years. Yeah, so there's a whole, our information has got, you know, there's a wealth of information in there. We've got, our organisations have got all sorts of programs and science programs and analysis going on the whole time. So I want to pull much more of that information into IBAT. So for example, IUCN red list of species at the moment, you can see the, the species ranges, but I want to include, you know, is that species population increasing or decreasing, for example? What are the key threats to that species within a particular area? What are the conservation actions that can be put in place? All of that information is within the IUCN red list. So we can start to pull that map more but again, remembering to do that in a, 
meaningful way that's um, interpreted correctly. Um, also, we do a lot of work on you know, creating global overviews of biodiversity in different ways. Um, for example, we've got some critical habitat maps, we've got some like natural modified habitat maps, so we're really pulling on the latest technology and science and creating layers that are useful for different users. So I want to pull more and more of that into the iBAT tool um, and any functionalities as well, added functionalities that people would like. So like this alert where you can um, get an alert if you've created a project and something has changed in the meanwhile, the boundaries of a protected area have changed, maybe the protected area has been de-gazetted or a new protected area has been put at that site mm -hmm. that you wouldn't have been alerted to otherwise or a species have moved from least concerned to critically endangered and all of a sudden performance standards have been triggered and you want to know that that information has changed. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of functionality I bring in. But I'm super, super keen to ensure that whatever we do is what users want and need, mm -hmm. rather than creating a tool that does lots and lots of things but doesn't do anything well for anybody. I want to do what we do well, really well, even if it's simple, but it makes it easy for users to access. So you're definitely open to feedback from anybody on maybe other features you might not have thought of, that um, people who are listening might be interested in talking about in the future. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Uh, brilliant. Well, while on that, have you got the uh, your contact details? Um, so yes. if any online uh, listeners want to get in touch with Eugenie, uh, you can get in touch with her email address um, there on the screen. Uh, and unless there's any further questions from our online audience um, or our audience here at IMRAST, I think it's just left to say thank you very much for coming in today and thank you everyone for tuning in to IMRAST TV. <laughs>